Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown. This is one of our more unusual episodes where one of my writers, in this case Kevin, has written me. It's basically like a game. Kevin has, I don't actually know how many stories it is today, and some of them Kevin has entirely made up, some of them are true, and I have to guess which ones are which. You don't have to do that, but it will be more fun if you do it as well. And at the end, we're going to find out which ones were real and which ones were fake. This is the third episode in this sort of series. The first one Kevin did, I guessed every single one and uh, Kevin totally beat Kevin. I think there were five entries, I got five for five. In the second one, Kevin beat me like three to two because he got better at it. And I get the feeling today I'm just going to get destroyed because obviously Kevin is learning. <laughs> and he's coming for you. Let's get into it. He's got me an intro video. We can watch this together and then we'll play the game. Let's go. You know what I'm saying? The well of internet mysteries is running a little dry, but nothing is wetter than the city's streets, overflowing with the blood of 400,000 murders that take place worldwide every year. That's over half a million gallons of delicious blood, and I have dove to the depths of those sanguine pools to bring you five mysterious tales of murder and death. It is your job to determine which of these mysteries are real. In which are the brainchild of a would-be murderer workshopping his ideas to see what would be most successful. As you can see, I've been keeping score. I expect this series to run at least as long as it takes for me to take the lead so I can retire as champion. Also, because there are so many murders every year, it's quite possible that one of the entries that I have declared to be a piece of fiction bears a resemblance to actual events that transpire that I am unaware of. If I declare a story to be fiction, but you know of a real-life incident that is extremely similar, be sure to get in the comments and let me know. All right, so it's not Internet Mysteries, my bad. One of the things with these is I go in completely unaware. Like, I've not looked at any of this before, because obviously that, that would spoil the fun. Um, so it's about murders. Kevin, mate, you know I do a podcast called The Casual Criminalist, which is all about murders. And I'm not saying I've heard of every murder everywhere, but I feel like... I got advantage on this one. <laughs> I'm gonna win because I'm better than you. I think. Let's go. And for those uh, who are listening, because this also goes out as a podcast, the current score I was wrong is eight to me, two to Kevin. So I think I beat him three, two on the second one. And obviously I got five from the first one. So let's go. The monster with 21 faces. This story takes us all the way back to 1984 in Japan. On the 18th of March at approximately 9 p.m., Katsuisha Izaki, the president of Izaki Glico, was in his home bathing with two of his children. That definitely sounds weird to me, but I guess it's a cultural thing. If Izaki Glico doesn't sound familiar, they are the confectionery company that makes every weeb's favorite snack food, Pocky, among a number of other products. I have no idea what Pocky is. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure what a weeb is. I've definitely heard of it. Is it someone from the West who really likes Japanese culture? I'm not I'm I'm not sure about that though. And I feel like I'm in some territory where I'll accidentally get cancelled for saying something. That night, two armed masked men broke into the house next door to Izaki, where his mother lived. They stole the spare key to Izaki's house and proceeded to enter it. They first found his wife and one of his daughters, who were tied up and locked in a bathroom. They then found Izaki and his other two children and abducted him, still naked from the home. The rest of the family was left unharmed. Izaki was taken to a small warehouse in Ibaraki in Osaka Prefecture, still wearing nothing but the ropes his captors used to bind him. At around midnight, the kidnappers contacted the director of Izaki Glyco and gave him directions to a phone booth that contained their ransom note. They asked for 1 billion yen, well, $4.5 million in 1984, over $8 million today, and 100 kilograms of gold bullion. Oh my god, that is a lot more than the amount you're asking for in cash. That's $90,000 in 1984, or over $6 million today. Good lord. Wait, is that? I th thought it would be more than $8 million. That seems actually quite reasonable for gold. I thought gold was crazy expensive. I really wish I'd invested more in gold when I was a toddler. Oh my god, don't we all? Gold's value is just 
so crazy. The ransom would never need to be paid, as three days into his capture, Izaki would finally be able to break out of the ropes that bound him and escape from the warehouse, though he could not identify his captors and had no useful clues as to their identities. But Izaki was free, and for a few weeks it seemed like everything was going to be fine. Then on April the 8th, the police received the following note. Quote, To Japanese police fools, are you stupid? There's so many of you. What on earth are you doing? If you are real pros, try catching me. There's too much handicap, so I will give you a hint. There's no fellows in the Izaki's relatives. There's no fellows in Nishinomiya police. There's no fellows in flood fighting corps. Car I used is grey. Food was bought at Dae. If you want new info, beg for it in the newspaper. After telling you all this, you should be able to catch me. If you don't, you are tax thieves. Shall I kidnap the head director of the prefectural police? The letter was signed, The Monster with 21 Faces, an homage to a recurring villain in a popular series of Japanese mystery novels. Two days later, trucks in the parking lot of Izaki Glyco's headquarters were set on fire. A few days later, a threatening letter accompanying a plastic container of hydrochloric acid were found. On May the 10th, Izaki Glyco would receive another threat from the monster, claiming that they had laced their candy with cyanide. The resulting recall cost the company $21 million and cost 450 part-time workers their jobs. When the distribution of the candy failed, the monster threatened to stock the poison products themselves. Security footage at a nearby store showed a man in a hat walk into a score and load a shelf with Pocky. The candy was removed before anyone purchased it, but it was 1984, so the security footage was not going to be very helpful in identifying a culprit. Isn't that what happened back in the day with, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't Tylenol, was it Ty? It was one of those drugs. And uh, someone was poisoning people by leaving, like, drug, taking drugs, poison drugs into drugstores, putting them on the shelf. People would buy them and then consume them, and it led to all of the like safety packaging around drugs and stuff. But that is crazy. Why would you do that? You fucking psycho. Eventually, the extortion attempts of Izaki Glyco stopped. On June the 26th, the monster issued a letter saying that they forgave Glyco. It is unclear what the company needed to be forgiven for or how they had atoned for their perceived sins, but I'm sure they were just happy to finally be left alone. Instead, the monster was now going to turn extortion attempts to Morinaga Dairy, Marilai Ham, and House Foods. What the monster's issue with all these food companies was remains unknown. Murray were quick in agreeing to pay 50 million yen, $210,000 ransom, to stop the harassment. On June the 28th, an undercover police officer disguised as Murray employee boarded a train where he was supposed to make the drop. He saw a suspicious man who he described as having eyes like those of a fox. Presumably, the monster knew that the ransom had been compromised and the signal to make the drop never came. Police attempted to follow the fox-eyed man, but he was able to lose them. I feel like some of these details, like the names of the companies do feel legitimately Japanese, but that means they could be legitimate Japanese countries. The eyes of a fox man feels too detailed to be made up. And it's not like one of those things where there's just unnecessary detail, which makes me think it's false. It just feels like that's too specific. I feel that that's real. On November the 14th, the same thing happened again, this time with House Foods offering to pay a ransom. Once again, investigators saw the fox-eyed man. Once again, the signal for the drop never came, and once again, he was able to elude the police pursuing him. That just feels a bit unrealistic, though, doesn't it? He's got these fox eyes. Is it not obvious who it is? Look for the foxy dude. The harassment continued, but no solid leads were ever obtained, unable to catch the gang criminals. Unable to catch the gang of criminals, on August 7, 1985, Police Superintendent Yamamoto of Shiga Prefecture took the only logical course of action. He committed suicide by lighting himself on fire. Hey, someone had to die to fit the theme of today's episode. Five days after his suicide, the media received the following message, the last that the monster would send, and it read, Yamamoto of Shiga Prefecture Police died. How stupid of him. We've got no friends or secret hiding place in Shiga. It's the superintendents in Hyogo or Osaka who should have died. What have they been doing for as long as one year and five months? Don't let the bad guys like us get away with it. There are many more fools who want to copy us. No career Yamamoto died like a man. So we decided to give our condolence. We decided to forget about torturing food-making companies. If anyone blackmails any of the food-making companies, it is not us, but someone copying us. We are bad guys. That means we've got more to do other than bullying companies. It's fun to lead a bad man's life. Signed, The Monster with 21 faces. Now it's time for you to make a decision, Simon. Was there really a gang of criminals terrorizing Japan's food companies for reasons unknown, resulting in the suicide of a police superintendent? And more importantly, is it fun to lead a bad man's life? I imagine it could be. 
I imagine it's like, yeah, you're like leading a criminal life. It's like, yeah, but then the consequences are just so scary. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was robbing banks. It was exciting. You got all this cash money. And then I had to go to prison. <laughs> and it was bad. That's, you know, that's the consequences, isn't it? Um, and also you're a criminal. So I guess that's like, it depends how morally flexible you are. Um, I think this one is true, Kevin. I'm in for it. I think it's true. The Eggman Cometh. The story comes to us from a little dive bar in New York City circa 2004. There was a kindly old man who hobbled into the bar every single day. I'm sure the first thing that came to your mind was alcoholic, but by all accounts, the man was not a heavy drinker. And by all accounts, I mostly just mean his waitress, Eli, who was there almost every day serving him. Every day was the same story. The man would slowly make his way to the bar, cane in hand, and pull up a stool. He would sit there, order a plate of eggs, and never speak a word to anyone. Honestly, it sounds like the perfect customer to me. I've spent far too many years working retail and so have little patience left for people who don't spend nearly enough money for the time they want to spend talking to you. Eli didn't specify, but I suspect he was a good tipper. The quiet ones normally are. The pattern repeated itself at least the year and a half Eli had been working there, and who knows how long before she started. When I said the old man came over to the bar every day, I do mean day, not night. As it was the day shift, the bar was always relatively empty, just your typical handful of alcoholics, third shift employees finishing off their days, and old men eating eggs. What's a third shift employee? How does that work? Would that be like if midnight to eight? Midnight to 8 p.m. 8 p.m. No, that doesn't make sense because then that would be people coming in the middle of the night. I guess it's people who are finishing their job earlier in the day and so are having a beer earlier because they have to go to bed early to wake up and do like an early morning shift. I don't know. But then one day, the narrative changed to be a pretty boring story if it didn't. A belligerent young man named Trent came into the bar for some day drinking and decided to sit directly next to the old man and his eggs despite there being plenty of empty space at the bar. Within minutes, Trent was four more sheets to the wind than one would expect from half a beer. That or is just a massive bell end, as you Brits would say. Yes, yes. That sort of person is like, if you're just quietly having a drink and someone just sidles up next to you, it's like, bro, the whole bar is free. Are we going to have a conversation? It's like, wasn't the fact that I'm just looking down at my eggs, just quietly eating these eggs, a signal that I don't want to be joined. I'm just here to drink and eat my eggs, not for company. So far, I'm definitely leaning towards this story being made up. It feels like it feels made up, but the, obviously we're, we're yet to get into the actual important part of the story. Trent began to hassle the old man, being rude and aggressive for no particular reason other than to assert his dominance as the alpha male of the nearly empty room. <laughs> Unfortunately for this young whippersnapper, he was about to learn why people always tell you to respect your elders. The old man unscrewed the top of his cane and, in Eli's words, pulled out a motherfucking sword. He ran Trent through with the sword, wiped the blade clean, always good practice as blood is corrosive and can ruin the sword, screwed his cane back together and just waited before the cops arrived. This happened in broad daylight, or as broad daylight as you like to get in a dive bar, and the old man was well known to regulars as a daytime fixture. The thing is, because he never spoke to anyone, nobody actually knew anything about him. They could give the police a really good description, but other than his cane, he was a pretty generic-looking old man. He always paid in cash, so there were no receipts with his name, and the best Eli could remember was that one time he had mentioned his name. It was either Gene or John, but it had been so long that he didn't remember which one anymore. That would at least be something to go on. <laughs> Right, so there's an old dude called either Gene or John. You're really narrowing that one down. Except there are 8.8 .8 million people in New York City. Based on data from the United States Census regarding the commonality of individual names in America, there would be approximately 6,750 people named Gene living in New York City. John is obviously a much more popular name, so that would give us approximately another 146,000 potential suspects. That's a load of people to investigate, and quite honestly, Trent didn't seem like he was worth the trouble. All kidding aside, I'm sure the fine officers of the NYPD did their best to track down the old man who's completely badass cane, but it also probably wasn't a high priority. While I don't think the old man could hide behind self-defense in court, he also wasn't unprovoked and it's doubtful that this was the precursor to a massive killing spree. The guy wasn't Kaiser Sosa, he was some old dude who legit needed a cane to walk. Yeah, but he didn't need a sword inside that cane, did he? Um, also, what the f***, Kevin? He murdered someone in the middle of the day. And it's like, he, Trent didn't deserve it? I mean, Trent deserved it? No, he didn't. He was just being a dick. Just because you're a dick doesn't mean you should be murdered by a sword, Kevin. Jesus. So where do you land on this, Simon? Did Trent have it coming? 
Maybe Trent needed a whack over the head with the cane and told to like bugger off like, you know, Biff Tannen would do in Back to the Future, like, get out of here. But, um... No, he didn't deserve to be murdered. Did an old man commit a public murder in the middle of the day without ever being caught? Or was all of this just a fairy tale and the Trents and Trevors of the world are still wandering around without ever getting their comeuppance? Um, I think it's fake. I think it's fake. I don't think there's enough details. I think it just feels a bit like the cops would have done more in reality. I think it's fake. So one, one, we one real, one fake so far. Murder on stream. Ooh, I feel like I would know about a murder on a st on like a live stream though. Wouldn't I? It's sort of my world, like this online content, you know, video thing. I feel like I would know this. Before there was Twitch, before there was YouTube, even before Big Brother made its television premiere in the Netherlands, there was Jenny Cam. All right, never heard of that. Until then, live webcams were just pointed at stationary objects like a coffee pot. They were pointless, but it was the mid-1990s, so we were all on dial-up anyway. The concept of streaming audio would have blown our minds, let alone streaming video. I remember the first time I saw a streaming video. I can literally remember the moment. I came home from school, and uh, they'd installed broadband in my parents' house, in my the house I grew up in for the first time and it was like before that we were on like i don't know 128 kilobits a second or whatever and suddenly we had like one megabit and it was wild it's like oh my god what's going on and maybe it was even half a megabit but it was it was ridiculously fast anything we'd had before and so i remember thinking wait can we stream videos now and my dad was like i'm already on it i'm watching people mountain bike downhill and I was like, I just went through to the my dad's study and he was just watching like a streaming video on a tiny little square player of uh, people downhill mountain biking. And I was like, this is crazy. We're in the future. <laughs> I would guess that was around 2002, 2003, maybe? Maybe it's slightly earlier than that. On April the 3rd, 1996, 19-year-old college junior Jennifer Ringley installed a webcam in a college dorm. Every three minutes, the latest picture from her camera would automatically upload to her website. Like I said, most of us were on dial-up, so streaming full-on video wasn't really going to happen. The camera was left on for 24 hours a day, and anyone could watch her life. For the most part, it was pretty mundane. Jenny was just a normal college student doing mundane things throughout most of the week. However, she wanted to document everything honestly and completely, so nothing was filtered. If she was horny, she could whip out her dildo on camera and go to town. If she was entertaining a gentleman caller, you could watch her engage in hardcore, uncensored action at a stunning 0.005 frames per second. But mostly, she was just doing homework, watching TV, or sleeping. There wasn't any audio either, so she had to communicate through holding up signs for a viewing audience. This is weird, but it feels fake. It feels too fake. It doesn't feel like anyone would actually do this. Or it would be allowed to be broadcast back in the day, right? In the early days of her show, Jenny would occasionally perform strip teases for the camera. A group of hackers discovered her website and started taunting her, but when she found the incident funny instead of being upset, they started making threats in her life. That was less funny, so she stopped doing strip teases, but she would still have sex and masturbate in front of the camera, so I'm not really sure what was accomplished by either party. See, now that makes me think it was it's fake. But then the fact that Kevin admits to it and is just like, this seems weird, makes me think that it's not fake and Kevin is su surprised by something. And I don't think Kevin would necessarily be surprised by an idea that he came up with. And this feels too good to be faked. So I'm going the other way and I'm leaning back towards real. By June of 1997, Jenny was already charging for entry into the members' version of her site, which offered more frequent image uploads. After graduating college in 1998, Jenny moved to Washington, D.C. and upped her webcam accounts from one to four to capture her larger living space. Later that year, she would appear on The Late Show with David Letterman, who could not get her very simple URL correct, even after being correct, and was very sexually aggressive towards her. She was also featured on The Today Show and World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Wait, David Letterman? This... <laughs> What's going on? He was sexually aggressive? I feel like... Really? I don't, that doesn't feel real. I don't really know who David Letterman is, but surely that would... When was this? 1998? What do you mean by sexually aggressive, Kevin? I don't know what this means. So I, I don't know if that would be... 
I don't know. I don't know. I'm really back and forth on this one. At the height of her popularity, Jenny Cam had estimated 3 to 4 million people watching the site every day. Good lord. It's probably a difficult number to gauge exactly since analytics were much less refined back then and the website was built to require constant refreshing, but she was clearly extremely popular. That is always going to happen when you're a first person exploring something new. Well, no, that's not necessarily true. The thing you're exploring could be sh um, it has to be something people are interested in. When Jenny prepared to move from DC to California in 2003, she started receiving a lot of heat from fans because of her choice in male companions. Jenny's friend and love interest Dex was helping her move. Normally, something like this wouldn't raise an eyebrow. Moving is a giant pain in the ass, and it's expected that friends and relatives will help you move out in exchange for some takeout pizza. The issue arose because Dex was actually the fiance of Jenny's good friend and fellow cam girl Pamela. I'm just realizing. I don't think I've ever had anyone help me move house. I'm always just like, well, if I'm moving house, there's a company that come and they take all your shit, they put it in boxes and they move it to the new place. Or before I had to do that, I just had so little stuff that I'll just pack it into my car. Why, why would you need your friends to help you? Because you're going to need a van and the man from the van is going to move all the... Is this an American thing? I figure it might be an American thing. Because I see it in movies. And now I'm wondering why people just don't. Where's where are moving companies in America? Stealing your friend's fiance is bad enough, but proceeding to have sex with them live on the internet while your alleged friend is on stream crying over having her heart broken is the kind of douchebaggery that makes people cry out for vengeance. This sounds like a very modern story in a very old, like, uh, refresh the page to get a new screenshot of the camera time. After a little striptease fiasco when a group of teenage hackers trolled her, Jenny must have gotten a bit numb towards death threats. She was likely receiving them most of the time she was streaming because that's just the sort of thing the internet likes to do, especially to women. This time, however, would be different. I also feel like the technology is a bit too much for this, like the teenage hackers, the, um, the sex online. It feels like a modern story that's slotted into an old timey situation. So maybe this has happened or something similar has happened in the modern day and Kevin's using this to make a past story. And for that reason, I'm again, I'm leaning, I'm leaning towards fake. I'm definitely leaning towards fake again. This time, however, it will be different. One of the biggest issues with installing cameras all over your house and streaming them to public, aside from the complete and total lack of a private life, is that your viewers are intimately familiar with the layout of your house and where your cameras are. A would-be intruder already knows where the blind spots are and where to look for the cameras to disable. December the 31st, 2003 would be Jenny's last ever stream. She could be seen alone in a new California apartment preparing to go out for a New Year's Eve party. By this point, internet speeds have reached the point where she she could now have an actual stream rather than one picture every three minutes, which meant that her exact whereabouts in the apartment were known to viewers in real time. As Jenny went into the bathroom, the one room without a camera, the viewers of her stream suddenly saw the cameras flip off one by one. The microphone on her computer was still recording, so after the last camera went black, Jenny's viewers heard the sounds of her scream quickly silenced by three gunshots. No, this is fake. This is so fake, Kevin. Uh, I'm, I'm like really pushing hard towards 90% confidence there because why would the camera why would the computer be streaming audio like if this is a web show it'd be like there'd be cameras and they would do video and audio or just video as we saw before maybe audio had been introduced but why would the computer also be streaming audio and where would that go to that doesn't make any sense also the three gunshots just feels like weirdly you know movie professional like like why why? Given the very public nature of this murder, the killer did not have long before the police would arrive. They were prepared for this and managed to vanish without a trace. While well, there would be traces. Where? What about the, uh, the, the bullets? What about the shells from the gun? There'd be traces. There'd be many traces. While the obvious speculation was that it was either a fan of Pamela's that sought revenge or a bitter fan of Jenny's shocked by the immoral betrayal, the identity of the killer was never found. Even if the IP of every viewer of both Jenny and Pamela was known, that would still mean there were millions of suspects. Police had a motive, but they had no physical evidence to point in any specific direction. What about the bullets? What about there'd be no footprints, no DNA at the scene? Beyond Pamela herself, who had a solid alibi back in DC. Jenny's own exhibitionism would be the recipe for her own perfect murder. What do you think, Simon? Was Jenny killed by an angry fan of Pamela's? Was she planning to quit her stream anyway and wanted to go all out with a properly conceived prank on her viewers? Or did I make all of this up and Jenny is alive and well? I think you made it all up, Kevin. If anything, it was a prank. But what am I getting points for? I don't think it's real. I think that's what we're gonna say. I don't think she was murdered. It's either a prank by her or it's um 
or it's entirely made up. So the thing we're doing gruesome things? No, she wasn't murdered. Pretty sure of this one, Kevin. I really think I'm on it with that one. If you get that right, you got it good. Maybe you should even get a bonus point. The RNG Killer the subject of this entry was a meticulous, remorseless killer. Despite all the care taken to never leave evidence at a scene, however, the killer was unable to avoid capture. On June 14, 2020, Dixie returned to her small home outside Houston, Texas, after finishing her late shift at the diner where she waitressed. Dixie was a 49-year-old divorcee with no children, the type of person that no one would notice was missing until her next shift at the diner, and she was scheduled to have the next two days off. No sooner than she set down her keys and passed than she heard the door open behind her. She turned around to see who was there just in time to catch the oncoming claw hammer with her face. Jesus. Is a, is a claw hammer a regular hammer? The yee yee. The blow, or at least the shock of it, knocked her off her feet, and a second strike to the back of the head would end her life. With that taken care of, our meticulous killer prepared to remove all evidence from the scene. However, there was a hole in the killer's research this time. He knew that his victim was divorced and always went straight home after her knife shifts, not one for late night socializing. While she had no husband or boyfriend, no children, and there was never any signs of movement when she wasn't home, Dixie did not live alone. Unable to afford a nursing home, she had taken in her elderly father to provide him with hospice care as his health rapidly declined. Her father was the kind of Texan who would name his daughter Dixie. Confined to bed, he could no longer walk and barely sleep. I know what's coming. He's got a fucking gun under his pillow or something, doesn't he? He's like an old crazy man. He's like dying, but he's still like, there are six guns within grabbing range. But he could still aim his gun. As the killer walked through the house to begin cleaning, a single shot fired from the old man's bed striking the killer. It unfortunately missed any vital organs, but the pain and blood loss were enough to make the killer pass out. A neighbor called the police after hearing the gunshot. Once in custody, the killer smugly refused to offer any information. His driver's license identified him as Neville Catherick from Columbus, Ohio, over a thousand miles away. So what was he even doing here? What was his connection to the victim? Now an interstate matter, the FBI went to his home to try and find a link between the killer and the victim, but what they found was much, much darker. Um, this feels real so far, doesn't it? It feels very, very real. There appeared to be no link at all. Neville's small apartment seemed to be completely devoid of clues. They were surprised to find both his computer and cell phone in the room, neither password protected. The only interesting thing on the phone was a handmade app to allow the device to be controlled remotely from the killer's burner phone, allowing him to create a digital alibi using the phone's GPS. This could be useful if he wasn't caught in the act, but there was no question of guilt. It was simply a motive that they were searching for. There was a blank pad of post-it notes on Neville's desk next to his computer, so they did the old trick of gently coloring in the top sheet with a pencil to see oh, what the last thing written on the pad was. If you're thinking that's some silly old trope from old detective shows, which I totally was, surprisingly it really does work. The message on the post-it note revealed a string of numbers 12143734915 and 6. It wasn't an obvious code or cipher, it was too many digits to be a phone number, it was formatted too awkwardly to be an IP address, GPS coordinates or anything a string of numbers might normally be recognized as. The investigators searched Neville's computer for clues where they found a disturbing image. It was buried deep in a series of folders, but luckily for the FBI, the killer had not cleared his recent documents, so they didn't need to do much to find it. Now, for a guy who is using a burner phone to mask, uh, and it's got some sort of remote connection thing, so he can set up a technical alibi somewhere else, and then who doesn't realize that there's a recent documents folder, and he also thinks that, yeah, yeah, you could definitely hide something in your computer by just burying it in lots of folders. That's the sort of, that that doesn't add up. A person with that much technical knowledge doesn't have just a complete lack of technical knowledge somewhere else, right? That feels very weird. However, the rest of the story feels totally real. The image was titled Demographic Info, an innocuous enough name, and it featured a chart with various categories, each category with numbered entries. It's pretty obvious where this is going. It is? Wait, it's obvious where this is going? What are you talking about, Kevin? And the investigators applied the arbitrary string of numbers to the chart. White, cisgender female, dark hair, blue eyes, no visible tattoos or piercing, 45 to 50 years old, divorced, hammer, nine weeks since the last incident, 400 to 450 miles since last incident, home invasion. Wait, so are they real? So is this guy a hitman receiving some sort of code? Suddenly, the FBI was hit by the realization that this was a serial killer. Oh, okay, so he's like writing down his, like, who he killed and where. Okay, Jesus. 
Dixie fit the description, and presumably it would have looked like a typical home invasion gone wrong had Neville not been interrupted, but who had this person killed nine weeks prior and 400 miles away, and how many times had this been done before? Armed with this new information, Neville was again interrogated, this time by the FBI rather than the local police. Neville, smug as ever, offered no new information, just a proposal. Prove you're smarter than me, otherwise you should probably hire me. When pressed regarding how many murders the killer had committed, they replied, I won't give you any hints. Find the bodies and prove they're my work. I'll tell you when you're done. Wait, this isn't the sort of thing. This isn't like some. Uh, did you guys ever watch that TV show White Collar? Love that show. Where the guy goes to prison for like, I don't know, forgery or fraud or something, but he's like, an unbelievably good con man. So he gets out of prison by agreeing to like work for the FBI and help them. It's such a cool TV show. I don't think that works for murder. <laughs> it's like, you were such a good murderer that we're gonna let you out of prison and you're gonna work with us to help us solve murders. Doesn't work like that. He did offer to cooperate in exchange for immunity and employment at the FBI, but that offer had been declined. I know you can get cybersecurity jobs by hacking companies or government agencies to prove they need your help. Yes, you you might be able to, but also it's not really a job that because they're like, yeah, 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 you can help us out. And what what are we gonna pay you? Oh, we're just gonna pay you not prison. <laughs> But I'm pretty sure it doesn't work for murder. Yes, agreed, Kevin. Also, don't go hacking places. Try and get a job there. Just go through the normal channels. Please don't take that advice from Kevin. Don't do it. But who knows? Maybe the killer will get that job after all, just after he finishes serving his life sentence in prison. So what do you think, Simon? Just how many people has this person killed before? Did they even kill anyone else? Was there a thus far undiscovered link between Neville and the victim, and everything else was just a futile ploy to try and escape prosecution? Or is this all just a work of fiction design? to make you lose your faith in humanity. I don't think it's real. I feel like I'd have heard of this. I feel like doing a true crime show, you know, I feel like I'd know this one. Although it does feel like there's some really good random details in there which makes it seem realistic. And also, I know it's stupid, but the last two in a row have also been no's. Um, but I'm saying no. And I think Kevin before has said that he random numbered them to make them in random orders because i don't think normally you put three look i think it's fake i think it's fake so we've got real fake 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 and now we've got the last one number five the disappearance of brandon swanson our final story takes us to the heartland of America, Minnesota to be exact. On May the 14th, 2008, regular college student Brandon Swanson went to a party with his friends to celebrate the final day of classes. He left the party to drive home, but wound up driving into a ditch instead. Despite the obvious conclusion you would want to make, his friends all swore that while he did have some alcohol, he barely had any and seemed perfectly fine to drive. Nah, you're fine, mate! You're, you'll make it! You'll be fine! Go on! Yeah! <laughs> Woo! Oh, don't drink and drive. Come on. The car was stuck, but Brandon was otherwise unharmed. He called his parents and told them it had drove into a ditch in Linz, the town next to where he lived, and he asked them to come pick him up. His home was only about 10 minutes away, so it wasn't long before his parents arrived on the road in Linz that Brandon said he drove off. Problem was, they didn't see him anywhere. They slowly crept down the street, flashing their headlights for him to see, not at all distracting or suspicious for any oncoming traffic, especially seeing as this was about 1am. Brandon couldn't see them anywhere, so he went to his car and started flashing his headlights as well in the hopes that his parents would see him, but they did not. His mother was on the phone while his father was driving, and as they both helplessly flicked their lights on and off, tensions and frustration grew. His mother got so frustrated with him that Brandon hung up on her before they found each other. Dude, they're coming to find you. You drove your car into a ditch, probably, allegedly, because you had a little bit too much booze. Come on, have some respect. Fortunately, when she called him back, he answered and she apologized. <laughs> Annoyed and confused, Brandon decided, well, f this, he could see the city lights of Lind, and it was a straight shot from where his car was stuck, and he was just going to walk there since he had a friend that lived in Lind. Based on the distance of the lights, he figured it was about a 30-minute walk. Brandon's father, I would... What are you doing? I don't, if I drove my car into a ditch and I'd had a little bit to drink, I'd be like, there's no f***ing way I'm calling my parents. I'll, I'll tell them about the car tomorrow, but I'm not hassling them at 1am to come pick my drunk ass that has crashed his car off the side of the streets. It's not far away. If it was two hours walk, I'd do the f walk. 
the walk of shame. Brandon's father dropped his mother off back at their house, then drove back to Lynn to try and meet his son. He had decided to stay on the phone with Brandon while he walked since it was late out, and he wanted to know his son arrived safely and ideally to pick him up and take him home. As you can tell from the title of this section, he never got that chance. Brandon directed his father to a nightclub parking lot in Linz that was a popular meeting place. The two remained on the phone together as Brandon walked for 47 minutes. Then suddenly he yelled, oh sh**, and the call disconnected. His father tried calling him back several times, but there was no answer. As far as last words go, he could do a lot worse than oh sh**. I imagine this would be exactly what I sort of last words. It would be like, there's a car who is, oh sh**. And then bang! You just knocked out by a car or just anything like that. You'd be like, ah, oh, ah, oh, the old bugger. <laughs> anything like that. That will absolutely, assuming I don't like die in my sleep, which would be preferred in that case, my last words probably be like, good night! <laughs> which is uh, less cool than, oh, sh the entire time they were on the phone, both of his parents said he was able to converse normally and seemed himself just frustrated over the situation, but he did not seem intoxicated in any way. They turned to Brandon's friends to help look for him and searched the entire night to no avail. At 6.30 a.m., his mother called the Lynn Police Department to report Brandon missing. Unfortunately, the pol response from the police was a bit delayed. They felt it was not uncommon for a college freshman to stay out the entire night partying on the last day of classes. Uh, leading me to believe that they didn't actually listen to what his parents had to say at all. They also said that because he was legally an adult, he had a right to be missing. Good work, police. I mean, yes, agreed. It's totally not unreasonable for him to be out tonight. Except this bear, he'd crashed his car and his parents had a conversation with him. And there's uh, the oh thing, he's on the phone, like, what are you doing? Later that day, there was a massive twist in the story. Cell phone records showed that Branson, who was absolutely positive he was in Lind and knew exactly where he was, had actually been 25 miles away in the city of Porter. Police search dogs were used, and they followed Brandon sent from his car to the Yellow Medicine River. One of the more popular theories is that Branson fell in the river and drowned, explaining both his last words and why the phone cut out. This would make a lot of sense, except the dogs followed his scent to the other side of the river and up the bank to a gravel road, where it eventually ended. Whatever happened from that point onward is completely unknown. No trace of Brandon or any of his belongings other than inside the car has ever been found despite almost 15 years of searching. Even if he fell into the river and broke his phone, it certainly seems that he got out. While we don't know for sure there was a murder, foul play has not been ruled out, and it shouldn't be, because if his death was just an accident, surely there'd be some sort of evidence somewhere. So, Simon, how could Brandon disappear without a trace? And if he was indeed not drunk, as his friends and family said, how could he have been so very, very wrong about his location? That is super weird. And it's the sort of weird detail that I don't know. I don't know why. And uh, it makes me think it's very, very real. So I'm saying this is real. And the most important question of all, well, I finally have the winning score for this episode. Oh, Kevin, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident about this one. I'm probably going to be proved entirely wrong, but I definitely think it's true, false, 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 true. Uh, let me just remind you what we had. We had the monster with 21 faces. So you can play along at home. Remind yourself of what you said. Don't cheat. The monster with 21 faces. That's the one in Japan about the food companies. The Eggman Cometh, which is the dude who's just eating the eggs in the bar and then he gets murdered with the sword. The murder on stream. Obvious one about the murder on the stream. The RNJ Killer, which is the unknown serial killer thing. And then the final one about the road dude in the car ending up in the wrong town. For me, true, false, 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 true. Get your votes in, and we're going to watch Kevin's outro video, or you're going to listen to it if you're listening at home. Here we go. In the outro video, he reveals the answers to us. I've tried to fool you twice now with the anime plots, and I was hoping you thought I was trying to do it again. Well, no one knows who the monster with 21 faces is, or what evil deeds they've been up to, um, other than attempted murder, extortion, arson, and all of the other stuff we talked about in this episode. The story is 100% real. More importantly, it absolutely is fun to live a bad man's life. <laughs> okay. While the Eggman was a real person, to the best of my knowledge, he never actually killed anybody. The story was inspired by a tweet from comedy writer Ellie Kymondell, who mentioned an old man with a sword in his cane from when she used to be a waitress. There's only so much room for character development in a 280 character tweet. But I like to think that if he actually did kill anybody, that no one in the bar would have snitched on him. When Jennifer Ringley first saw 24 hour live streams of a coffee pot in an aquarium, she decided that she was at least as entertaining as a goldfish and should give it a go for herself. 
Jenny Kim is a little before your time, so I'm hoping you didn't call bullshit on this story because you've never heard of her. The story of her murder absolutely is bullshit. I'm just hoping you didn't win on a technicality. Yes! I told you it was bullshit! About Jenny Kim is true up until the point of her murder. Okay, cool. That's exactly what I said. I said, or like I said, it's either fake or it's a prank. Um, but I'm right. It's bullshit. She wasn't murdered. When Jenny stopped streaming on December 31st, 2003, it wasn't because she was murdered. It was because PayPal was instituting an anti-nudity policy because I guess Bring they ate money. <laughs> Jenny is alive and well, but has maintained absolutely no internet presence since she stopped streaming. I think I could have made a really good criminal a hundred years ago. I'm definitely smarter than the police. I'm not <laughs> smarter than forensic evidence. And I'm far too clumsy not to leave behind a strand of hair or a massive load of jizz at a crime scene <laughs> accident. Dude. Also, my sister was dumb enough to send away to one of those DNA ancestry websites. <laughs> so many crimes I commit would come back to her as a familial link anyway. As such. I've done one of those DNA websites and I was like, this is gonna really be, really be a problem for my future crimes. My dreams of being the RNG killer will never come to pass, but it's still fun to think about. Also, the name Neville Ketrick is an anagram for Kevin the Killer, and I'm sure you weren't gonna fall for that same thing twice. Oh, I did pick up on it. To this day, the disappearance of Brandon Swanson remains unsolved. Oh wait, did I just totally miss on that? That was a super short one. Um, yeah, so... This is, uh... Well, that was false, so I'm four for four. Partly because of the delays in investigation when his parents reported him missing. Because of this, they were able to successfully lobby the state legislature to enact Brandon's law. It's real, isn't requiring it? Requiring that five. missing adults actually be taken seriously and promptly. So how did you do, Simon? Five for five, sure Gavin! for the most casual of criminalists, these deadly entries must have been no problem for you. Ah, oh, you're right. You're right. You, you, I, I, you know, I do a whole podcast about true crime. I, I, I said at the beginning, I think I got a pretty good beat on this stuff, and I did. Five for five, Kevin. What's the score now? Like thirteen to yes. How did you do at home? Let me know in the comments if you're watching on YouTube. If you're enjoying this as a podcast, leave me a review. That would be fantastic, and I'll see you in the next episode. I'm about to email Kevin and let him know how I did. <laughs> Thank you.